where I try to look in my in my camera instead of the screen. <laughs> uh, good morning for some of you who are in California side of the earth. Good afternoon for us who are on the East Coast of United States and Canada. And good evening for our friends who join us from Europe, Asia. I guess Asia is totally out. It's like good night. Well, anyway, hello. My name is Vladislav Yeliseev. I know you were wondering how to pronounce it. Uh, there, we have a lot of participants today. Let me, at this time, I don't know. I don't have a count right here. Yes, 103. Uh, Call me Vlad if you want to, just when you type your questions. Now, I have on uh, Zoom, I have the uh, questions and answers um, window open here for me. So I'm going to look at it, okay? First of all, I want to thank you for joining, joining. First of all, okay, I'm not scripted. Hey, first of all, <laughs> I'm going to thank you joining me here today in Florida in my studio. It's a nice day outside, and we are going to talk about watercolor. Most important, we're going to talk about fine arts in general. That's what actually uh, I want to talk a lot about it. I'm going to show you some techniques, I'm watercolor techniques, and I'm going to answer your questions. And I already have a lot of questions which you sent me by email. And I looked at some of them, but let me just address everything uh, in, uh, in Zoom uh, because lots of them are repeating itself. So, but let's get to the questions a little bit later. Basically, my friends, uh, the philosophy of uh, fine arts is what actually uh, I'm interested in. And I'm thinking all the time, why I'm here, why I'm painting, what I want to express. Um, what's most important, to be honest with you, it's what I'm going to leave behind when I will be gone. What I want to people look at when I will be gone. And uh, what I'm going to leave for people, maybe nothing, probably, most likely. But still, there has got to be bits of something which is going to capture somebody's eye and they will be interested in looking at it. And that is what's important, I think most important is in, in everything I do. I can make money washing cars, fixing cars. I can do many things, but I choose this profession for a reason. And that reason is to leave something behind. I listen to the music a lot. And sometimes I think and when I listen to the music of Brahms, uh, music of Beethoven, uh, Mozart, uh, Handel, uh, what was driving force behind with their creations. And I really think that they were thinking about the future generation, listening to this music, being moved by that music. And that is really important, I think. Uh, cars are gone, houses are gone, everything is gone. Music stays, art stays with us. And it's going to stay for us as long as humanity, I'm going to touch the screen, it's going to, it's going to sleep. And the, and the humanity is going to cherish, listen, and sponge on that. Now, uh, philosophy of the arts is very important. And uh, a lot of questions asking me, Vlad, uh, what do you think uh, when you're choosing the subject matter? What are you looking for when you're choosing the subject matter? And um, it's hard to answer, to be honest with you. I think it's hard to answer because all of that is very individual. It's based upon your experience. It's based upon your life experience, your childhood experience, your events which happened particularly to you, which is you moved in. And I would suggest you to listen to yourself mostly. Don't look at the work of other artists and copy them. It is their world. Uh, they created something which was actually touching them, moving them. And therefore, that art they created, that music they wrote is very emotional and uh, affects you, not because it's good per se, but because it is part of the creator. Does it make sense? I'm, I try to be in a simple terms. So basically, I know I read somewhere that Manet, in a, I love that painter, 
uh, impressionism, and it really rings the bell with me uh, because of that nature of reinterpretation of, uh, of the environment, of the sceneries through the eyes of the creator, for the artists, through the eyes of the artist. I heard and I read that Manet, late in his life, and Giverne in France, was walking for miles and miles and miles. They didn't, I don't know, they, did, I didn't, they didn't have the cars to drive around. They were walking uh, like uh, virtually on their feet. And he was walking for hours, looking for that view which he would which would move him. And that is actually is very important. He could probably not paint today or tomorrow because the view just didn't involve him. So I would say that whenever you next time you're going to paint something, I mean, think think about what is really important to you. Think about is there is anything in the view which moves you particularly, only then you will have a chance to move the viewer on your work. If you just like repeating something, which is like, uh, when you study, it's another story. Uh, when you study your arts, when you learn your skills, it is actually doesn't matter, you just have to learn. That's a hard period in your life. But basically, basically, when you are being in a creative mood, you have to express something which is really important, particularly to you. How to find out that and how to think about, you got to be a philosopher, I think. You got to be a thinker, I think. I mean, don't jump to the gun, like just let's paint this, that, that, that. Just stop for a second and think, what is actually I like? Go to museums, by the way. I was going to museums a lot when I was studying. And I said, oh, I'm not going to museums anymore. I've seen it everything wrong. I still learn it. Go to museums, good museums, fine art museums, and go through this like uh, halls, one, another, 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 in the different countries. In fact, they're so different. And then you will find out that uh, the general quality of paintings in the museum is very high, but there are certain paintings which you stop in front and it's just a showstopper. And there is something you really like in them. And just stop and look at it. You, I don't even read the names of the painters. I have to admit, I'm guilty of that. I don't read the story behind the paintings. I read the story behind the presentation of that. And some presentations are personally to me so powerful that I just can't get away from them. And other, right next to the painting to it, leaves me cold and uninvolved. I don't know why. And I just like look and look and look uh, and just pass, pass by them. You see what I mean? So basically, I think the general education, aesthetical education is very important for you, especially when you're learning the craft. These paintings, which are showstoppers for you, you have to pay attention to them. You have to really study them a little bit, stay and observe what is it exactly you liked in that painting. It is done most likely by a master because it is in a museum. So basically why that painting on the right, you don't care much, but this one moves you. And why is that music, by the way, sometimes you attend the concert, leaves you uninvolved and another music moves you, that you're sitting there, and I have to admit, I'm crying sometimes. Once I tell you the story, I was flying to my workshop, and sometimes it was so boring to fly. I put my headphones and put the music, and I did a mistake. I put my favorite Brahms symphony, I mean, piano, piano, piano concerto number one. And it was a big mistake, because like in, in, a, in a matter of seconds, my face got red. My eyes got like filled with tears and, and I'm like sitting there in, in the airplane and I'm just thinking, Jesus, I, and I can't pull it out because I like it so much. I'm got moved so much with that music. And I think the people around me, it was a long time ago before this, all this, you know, Corona things, I was not sick, no nothing, but I was definitely was looking weird. And I knew that I was looking weird. So I'm all red, sweating. I don't know what to do, pull them out. I pull them out, but I still continue like kind of tears going on my on from my eyes. I don't know what's going on here, guys, help me. So basically what I'm saying is there are certain things you have to pay attention to. Certain thing 
you have to not be ashamed of certain things you have to get intimately close. After visiting so many museums, I find out that there are certain type of paintings I really like. And those kind of style, that kind of representational skill, that kind of representation form really moves me. Mostly it is basically things which has depth. I know that basically it is hard to explain what do you mean by that it has depth. It, it has insight into artists' vision. Those things I call fine art. It's not just an eye candy and there's a lot of work I like just because they're so pretty. But actually, I prefer the work which moves me in that way of inside kind of vision. Let's say the portraits. I see a lot of skillfully made portraits which look alike at the person you depict, but there are other portraits, paintings of me. Those are, have insight into the character of the person you are looking at. Just looking at that person, you can tell a lot about that person. Not just the visual things, but his character, his lifestyle and that work is fine art it is classical music of fine art this is very important so so basically again to give you an advice i know you are here to hear that advice what to paint and what not to paint and i will tell you follow your instincts go outdoors walk around follow your instincts what moves you something like catch your eye and you like, oh, I like it. I, I just really like it. That is actually something probably for you to paint. You see what I mean? It's not like you, I like this color. I like this combination of colors. I like this shape. That's important. But most important is a depth of that scenery. And that depth is very, I repeat one more time because it's so important, that depth of scenery is probably related personally to you. If you're going to be honest with its representation, if you're going to do it skillfully, that's a second condition for that, people will follow you, people will like you, and you will probably be in a fine art category. All too often I see that actually artists sometimes just trying to show how beautiful it is and it is actually important and it's but to me it the, how beautiful it is it's a, it has to take a step back compared to the depths of the scenery i'm trying to depict that's all that's basically all. And I am looking sometimes through the photographs I took. I've been in the places. I work a lot with the photographs. And all this, by the way, paint alongs, which we are doing based on the photographs, which I'm having. And I took myself. And, uh, and basically, I remember being there. I remember the emotional impact it made on me. And therefore, I am able to paint it. Make sense? Because it has some, and some of you actually like this thing, that thing. It just basically, if you listen to music, you probably have to tell a lot about yourself. Music and visual arts are related very, very close. Look at this, my friends. Basically, we have three types of music, two types of music. We have classical music and popular music. Now, if you look at the work of art, it is immediately apparent to me, am I looking at the popular work of art or fine art? You see what I mean? So basically, you cannot dance to the music of Beethoven, but majority of people like to dance. When they listen to music, the, the first they click, it's like, how, oh, hey, it really moves me to dance. But did you notice that dancing music is temporary and that every three, four years, the music we were dancing three years ago sounds ridiculous, weird, and kind of strange to you, but the music of Beethoven always good. That tells me a lot about the uh, life of, uh, of life of your 
presentation, life of your shelf life. Let's talk about really like call it a shelf life of the, your painting. Uh, another another thing I want to tell you uh, what what is really going on here is that the beginner I I opened the uh, Renaissance School of Art in Sarasota. I live in Sarasota, Florida. It's the west coast of Florida. Yes, I know it's great. Uh, <laughs> In fact, beaches are open. I was on the, on the beach yesterday swimming. Uh, and I think it's very important to keep myself healthy, actually. Uh, being physically fit, eat well, sleep well. And uh, I have an assistant who is working with me, my dear friend, Jung Johnson, who actually leads me into lifestyle, which, which, which I, I, she lives in, um, in, um, in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. And she actually sends me some kind of things which, which I, I should do. And I follow it uh, closely and I feel good. In fact, um, I feel better than in my 17s. When I'm in, I was last time in a subway, I could do 10 story high stairway on that escalator running from bottom to up nonstop. I couldn't do that when I was young. So I feel good. Well, anyway, your physical performance, by the way, is very important. If you're in pain or somehow like shoulder pains, neck pains, this, this, and that, that would prevent you, absolutely prevent you from creating a good work of fine art because you are being kind of distracted by that. All right, so we're talking about a lot of things today. In fact, if we stay a little bit longer than one hour, which, which we kind of allocated for this, it's, it's totally fine with me. Uh, and, um, and I have no problem with that. Now, uh, another thing, I just have a list over there, what, I'm, what I have to talk about. And so, uh, and so basically, I don't want to uh, really um, showcase of materials. All right, let's talk about materials. Let's go to the practical terms, all right? And again, your questions could, could be concerning about anything, and I will try to answer, answer your questions. In fact, I have to tell you who you are talking to. I'm the guy who was in fine arts since age, since age fourth grade, 14 maybe. So I was in uh, one year, I started my art journey in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of like a, a club, art club. Uh, it was very professional, by the way. Looking back, we immediately <laughs> were studying uh, uh, casts, like Roman and Greek casts. And, uh, and I, some, some students over there, I was looking at their, and their um, drawings of these casts. And I was thinking, I can believe one day I can do the same. Uh, eventually, uh, I, uh, in the next year, I entered art school in uh, Moscow. I was born in Moscow. And um, I, in the fifth grade, I entered that art school. And so I was started to uh, do my art education over there, which was pretty serious. They had a very good art, uh, uh, teachers who are professional artists. Um, and um, I'm thankful for them forever because at e exactly at that time uh, they gave us the idea about what you have to actually look for museums etc cetera, etc cetera, we were talking about and then when it was time and my my students from the uh, level uh, um, paint along live sessions already know I told them about it I just repeat because we have so many more participants um, uh, when I was time to continue my education, I talked to the professional uh, uh, artist at the time, and they, and they, uh, and they uh, told me that you, I have to blood go to uh, Saint Petersburg, to uh, Saint Petersburg Academy of Art, to continue your professional education. And I said, well, I, I I'm from Moscow, and I, I don't want to really. Uh, live in uh, dormitories because I know how poor conditions were there and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, alcoholism, you won't believe it. But nevertheless, it's Russian thing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I said, I want to stay with, in Moscow. And they said, in this case, you just have to be, become an architect. <laughs> and I said, what's why an architect, for God's sake? And they said that, um, well, architectural school in Moscow is part of that St. Petersburg Academy of Art, and they will teach you how to draw well. Boom. Wow, how to draw well, they said. They will teach you how to draw well. 
my friends, that's a key word. They knew. These people, a great, actually, painters knew what's involved, how to draw well, and how important it is for us to learn the scales. If you want to write the music, you need to know and learn the scales. That's what actually they told me, Vlad. Learn your A, uh, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Si. And we did. For three years, we were drawing nothing but like primitive things like cylinders. You see? This is a napkin. Cubes, spheres. And it's like you cannot take it anymore. Then they put us onto these casts. Greek and Roman casts, which you study for another number of years and all parallel with these primitive forms. And then you study geometry and then you study uh, all uh, math and then you study uh, material and everything because you're an architect, you know. So basically they knew what they were talking about. And that's why just recently I realized that the biggest and a single improvement you can make for yourself is to learn how to draw. It's a fundamental for the artist to know how to draw very well. I just come out recently with a very short, very cheap DVD, which called Basic Drawing for Outdoor Painting, when I touch all the aspects of that, uh, of that practice, so to speak, to draw in well. Because when you're going outside with your easel, you set up your easel, you this and take a foot and then and then and you, you're going ahead. First of all, you, you're dealing with a drawing. If you don't draw well, they told us, it doesn't matter how well you are a painter, like applying the colors, your brush strokes. And so they said, it's not going to fly. You have to learn how to draw first to be comfortable with this. In fact, when I'm drawing, I don't even think about this anymore. It's like writing a letter. You pick up your pen and you write something. You don't think about individual letters. You think about the idea you put behind your sentences. And that is really important. But that's the hardest part. So basically, basically what I will tell you my friends, my first advice to you, if you want to improve immediately from now on and forever, is just get your sketchbook, get your soft pencil, and wherever you walk, wherever you go, where soon airports will be open soon and you will soon will be travel, that sketchbook will follow you in your pocket. It's a small sketchbook where you draw people, cars, etc., etc. Does it make sense? I don't have that sketchbook anymore. It's in my past. I'm past that. I have no problem drawing anything, basically. It's a good idea to kind of keep yourself up, but still, you see, that's what actually is. Let's talk about materials now. My friends, materials. A few people, I got emails. They're asking, this palette, what is it like your palette is all about? This palette, my friends, it's a, it's a really cheap aluminum palette. You see how spacious? Spacious everything here. I can turn on this uh, top view, but I just I, I want to do this is aluminum watercolor palette. If you will um, Google aluminum watercolor palette, it will come out. This particular palette comes from South Korea, from uh, Liang or something, and he has like a 20 types of them. I just pick up this. This is good for me. This layout of paints is really, uh, is really uncomfortable. It has sections, one, two, three. You see what I mean? Even four. And this is a hole for your finger. And this is actually good when you are outdoors painting. It's very light. It doesn't rust. It's actually a pretty good palette, I would tell you. Uh, another company uh, from American, I think, I don't know, they were doing twice as big these sections over there. And, and, uh, and that was good, but they don't make that anymore. So I put same color into two sections. Like this is my cut yellow, you see? This is yellow ochre, yellow ochre gold, burnt sienna, burnt umber, Van Dyke brown, this, blah, 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 blah. We'll talk about it one second. So this is basically this. Google it. I think you can get it on Amazon and you can get it on eBay. That's not a brainer. My brushes are, my friends, 
My brushes, are, I have three types of brushes. I used to say two, but it's actually three types. I'm working closely with Rosemary Brushes, wonderful company from Great Britain, which where every brush is made by hand and, uh, and individually uh, crafted. And uh, so this is actually oil brushes. I'm using those brushes sometimes for the decisive rectangular brush strokes at the end of my painting. And those oil, bra oil brushes, they don't carry much watercolor and they're very rough. And that's exactly what I want because my goal is not to really um, show environment which I paint, the, the view which I paint in a photographic manner, but basically to interpret it. Let me tell you one thing about it. The camera actually, I'm, I'm not going to show you the camera, but camera is camera. It's actually a pretty, a pretty uh, primitive instrument. The camera sees everything correctly. The camera sees colors correctly. The camera sees values correctly tonal values, let's call it. But the camera doesn't see the way humans see in the world. And that's a problem. So the next time you're going to pick up your photograph and we're going to talk about it later. To the letter, it's not that how the humans see in things. And that's why probably your painting is not going to move anybody. Next, we have rosemary thin synthetic brushes. Look at this. These brushes are developed, oops, that's repetition. Three pointers I have here and one uh, sword line. Basically, that's all I need. The pointers are very pointy brushes. Uh, the tips are very pointy and the fiber is very springy. That's what actually allows me to work very, how to say it? a lot, it's like a Swiss knife of everything. It carries a lot of water. At the same time, I can really do a very thin long lines or I can do dry brush. I'm going to show you how to work with it. And there are three of them, 14, 14, 12, and number 10. This brush, uh, a sword liner, let me just wet it for you. The sword liner. You see how pointy this brush is? Uh, that brush is actually for the lines I'm doing, making. And I used to have a lot of liners and or druggers, you call them. But now I switch to this brush because I can go from wide to very thin lines simultaneously in one sweep. And that is really good and helped me to paint trees or variation in thickness of the, of the, of the brush. And that is really good. I worked for two years with this company. Every brush is made by hand, I repeat, and they put even as a thank you, they put in my name on this brush. And actually, if you go to my website, you can acquire these brushes are very affordable. And I cannot paint without them. I had a student who said, Oh, well, they're synthetic. Uh, I use only natural fiber brushes, my friends, it's like if you in a um, cooking business, you know that you have a lot, a lot of um, uh, different Japanese knives that they use in Japan. They have a, a knife for little task they're using. That's exactly what we are talking about. Another type of brushes I have here is that Kalinsky brushes. These are natural fiber, uh, uh, comes from, uh, which comes from Russia. It's, uh, it holds a lot of water, this brush, as opposed to this. If I will take a similar sizes of brushes, like, like my Kalinsky brush and the syn synthetic brush, uh, they, this brush, which is, um, I'm looking at my screen, which is natural fiber, holds probably three times more water than this one. So basically, when I start my painting, I use my uh, natural fiber brush. It's not squirrel, it's, uh, it's uh, how, what is called this animal, whatever, I'll, I'll recall, I'll tell you. Um, uh, and then you keep going and going and going, it's like never ending. It holds a lot of your paint from your, from your palette. And th but this one, look at this, how pointy it is. So this is much more for me interesting. I can actually do uh, this wash, 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 and then finish it with something nice. Uh, I call it happy Indian kind of uh, stroke, brush stroke. You see what I mean? So basically, and that's, that's three type of brushes. Now, 
uh, this natural fiber brushes, um, Kalinsky, Sable, uh, very expensive. They are cost a lot of money because uh, the good Kalinsky brush actually taken from the animal during the certain period of winter time, only from males and only from certain party of their underbelly, so to speak. So there are so just so many. That's why good Kalinsky costs so much, but and sometimes it costs more than two, three, four hundred dollars if it comes to the good size of it. Okay, so basically that's my that's that's the tools I'm using. I'm using a scratcher sometimes, and this is like a tool, just a tool. You can use a, a palette knife. And this scratcher has a different, you see, angles. And I just do, 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 do. And I just uh, recently did my nail and I'm like, ah, geez, I did it too short. Sometimes you can just scratch it with your nail. You know, sometimes uh, paint if you need a white line, if you don't want to use gouache too much. So uh, just use it or credit card, just use your credit card. Now, uh, when I'm painting, before anything I do, I do a sketch. My friends, I'm going to switch probably to the top view for you to look better. Let me just uh, do that. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm, you will see my face later. And But now we are going into the camera, which has a top view, all right? Let me just zoom in a little bit so you could see better. Uh, it's gone. OK, here you are. All right, let me zoom in. My friends, before I paint anything, I do type of sketch like this. Uh, the sketch I'm using, I'm using the paper. That's another sketch we did last, last uh, paint along. That was Havana. Uh, and before I do this, I'm going to use just this regular paper. It says regular, by the way, it's a regular um, laser jet paper in a regular, this kind of like, you know, this... Uh, this kind of office type plastic uh, board, uh, springboard, okay? And what, why I'm using it? Because actually it's easy to replace. You see what I mean? Sometimes you got on the rain or humidity is too high and your album is no longer good. So basically this kind of uh, type of um, uh, paper is easily replaceable. It's very important. If you are an uh, outdoor painter, plein air painter, to have materials which are, you can replace easy. You can go to any office around you, they will give you a few pieces. You see what I mean? Why to have the expensive stuff like um, albums and everything? The paper is very bright. The texture of this paper is very good. In fact, I'm using two types of LEDs. This is pencil, 07 millimeter uh, Pentel, uh, uh, automatic pencil with 0.7 millimeter diameter lead. And I have two types of them. One is soft and where I can do really dark, very fast uh, 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 shading. And another one is hard. You see this one I'm using for basically for uh, the watercolor paper. And this is HB lead softness. And this, uh, uh, somebody sent me an email asking me in detail what I'm using. So these both are Pentel automatic pencils. And this is 2B lead for the sketching. Softness is 2B and HB for the watercolor. Because if you will draw this with on watercolor paper uh, with this lead, it's going to mar it. And it's hard to erase if you did a mistake or anything else, okay? The actual LEDs I'm using are this. My friends, these are probably the best you can find. These are graphite uh, pilot uh, Japanese made LEDs. They are very good. They don't break as much and they are very dark. So that's two things you're asking from this. This is 2B and this one is HB. That these things I'm carrying with my, uh, with in my in my backpack, basically at all times, just to replace it. As you can see, I can use different different pencils, so I can switch back and forth. But both of them are zero seven because sometimes it breaks. They break a lot. They are not really uh, well made at all. Maybe uh, I don't know where you know. And so I know that I can take lead from here and use it in this pencil. So hard, soft. Enough of that, let's technicalities. What's important is my friends, and that before I paint anything, I will do this kind of sketch, all right? And that sketch is actually my future painting. 
if that sketch doesn't look good, oh, look, it doesn't look actually good. Uh, uh, but what I mean is like as a painting, if you can see a future painting here, then only the way I can start painting the real thing in watercolor. So it tells me two things. My friends, two things it's really important in your painting when you start. Supposedly you're working, working, I'm a Monet in France, I'm walking and walking and I see what I like, but the scenery is actually very complicated. So I have to basically simplify it. I have to zero in to two important things. The thing number one is composition. Composition, composition. I'm telling many languages. That's a key word in fine art. If your composition no good, your painting is no good. Simple as that. To learn composition is very hard. Believe it or not, it's the most difficult thing, the most complicated thing in the art of drawing. The drawing is, by the way, is not art. I have to correct myself. It's a skill. Uh, basically. Drawing consists of three things, composition, proportions, perspective. In fact, the DVD I mentioned before you, it's actually, did I mention it? I already forgot. Uh, uh, it touches all three aspects of this. Uh, in the sketch, the first thing we're actually taking care of is composition is very, very important. So basically, after that, I will explore the scenery a little bit more and making it a tonal balances the way I want them. And some sceneries, let me show you, by the way, this photograph, the way uh, this photograph or scenery, actually it was taken from. Let me give you a little bit of history of it. It was a three or four, two or three or two, three years ago, basically, at, in a forgotten coast, uh, Florida, there was a paint out event. And paint out event had a quick draw event where you have only two hours to paint something. So basically I found this view and everybody around me, oil painters were painting already halfway in and I was still on sketch something like this. And actually I uh, spent quite a lot of time for this. Basically how long, 20 minutes I'm spending on this more or less. The size should be really small. You see how small it is than eight by 10 your print paper, it just because I have to really shade it fast and take care of most important thing. Let me show you the photograph of real thing. It's not actually a real thing. It's I already adjusted it for you to see. But basically, let me see, share screen. Have a look at this. That's what you see right here is that exactly view. Oh my God, Vlad, why, why, I mean, how can you do in two hours painting like that? Look at this number of elements here. It's incredible. It's all these masts, everything. Let me just enlarge it for you. You see all these masts, all this, oh my God, I don't know what's going on there. It's, it's a total mess over there, okay? Pretty simple right side here. You see what I mean? But this is like how to deal with it is really hard. Uh, plus this water, reflections of it. And oh my God, it's really, really a lot. And so basically when I started this view, what did I look at? You have to ask yourself a question. What do you like there? I did like this thing, let me show you. That's what grabbed my attention. In fact, for some of you, probably there would be something else. That thing right here. I was, it looks like hard, by the way, it's an accident. Uh, it's actually, that's what it is. And I said, it's all about this. That's number one. I'm going to zero into this thing. What does it mean? Everything else is not that important. What's left to do after you realize what you like is how to nest it into that environment with much less elements to show the essence of the scenery. That is basically what is we are dealing here. Because actually this photograph, if I would just copy, it would take me much longer than two hours and it wouldn't be clear the way I actually try to convey here. 
So that's what is important here. The next thing I did like is this one. I like the really simplification of this element right next to complication of this one. And so these two things I said, okay, I'm going to contraposto them. One is going to support another. And therefore, let me just stop this sharing. So therefore, I, this is, was done just a few days ago at my workshop, we painted it together. I remember being there, so that's what actually I decided to do. I did this, just a few boards on, on the left side, I think uh, on the left side of the board, and then this big blank wall of there. You see, I enlarged the trees in behind in order to highlight the whiteness of this and whiteness of this. If you look at the photograph again, I'm going to show you in a second, there is no trees like this but I saw the trees to enlargen, enlargen the trees like this would actually benefit the painting and so it is. I'm not going to in, reinterpret this scenery into something which is not even close to it. I saw some paintings where painter take a scenery, like very mundane, mundane painting, like a very boring, and then they add this, bam, boom, bam, bam. And then I'm looking at the glorious street somewhere, who knows where. And I kind of like thinking, yeah, it looks good, but it's kind of like a jazz of fine art. It's like you're taking a tune and completely reinterpret it into something else. I don't actually like it doing myself because I repeat, my task as I see myself is go to the scenery, pick up what I actually moves me, I'm sorry, and then sort of reinterpret that mood, that scenery, which actually made an impact on me, hoping that it will make an impact on the viewer, okay? So, and basically after that, I painted it. This is the copy. That painting was sold, so I don't have originally. And so basically, let me zoom out a little bit for you. And basically, uh, that's what I arrived to this blankness of the wall, that, that kind of character for the board, a little bit of things over there and there. And I'm asking myself a question, what else can I actually show them? There is nothing really, really actually to add to this. That's my another uh, camera and you can see it from another angle, just like that. Now, we are, when I'm doing paint along, the setup is exactly the same, by the way, and everything is the same. So uh, uh, when I paint, you can see close up like this, for instance, look at this. And actually from this, you see, you can see clearly what I'm doing on this area, on that area, and that area. It's really quite interesting and wonderful. In fact, I have to mention that being stuck in our in studios and, uh, and, and uh, kind of being forced, uh, uh, just not going outside that much, uh, uh, it, it's, a great, it's a great way to actually push yourself a little bit. We have time to study a little bit. Uh, we have time to, um, uh, to explore what is it like we really wanted to improve in our paintings, etc., etc. Uh, what else are we going about materials? That's, that's about it. I have this sprayer over there, which I use, usually do sometimes. I spray it, and that's about it, my friends. That's pretty much about it. Uh, I have to mention that uh, the, next, the next paint along, which is going to be on, uh, on Sunday, we are going to ruffle the brush. So basically what we're going to do, it's a rosemary sword liner. And basically the lucky winner is going to be totally like, you know, my hand going into the jar and do, 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 pick up the lucky winner uh, is going to be uh, awarded and send it absolutely free. This brush is going to be just like, I'm gonna add a little bit excitement. I know, I know my, 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 my students, they say that it's so exhausting, it's so hard blood to paint after yourself. But my friends, you're learning yourself. So I hear you and to make it a little bit more interesting for you, uh, this, uh, this brush will go to the lucky winner next time on Sunday. And in fact, 
every session we're going to um, we're going to send a brush to like a winner just like you using the raffle okay so may 10th it's going to be uh, happening like that uh, what else i have to talk about it let's see philosophy or oh, on easel um what's on my easel my friends what's on my easel right now i just finished the um, planner painting i actually went outside here in florida and i just uh, painted it there it was wonderful feeling and uh let me just switch the cameras all right and that uh the guy we actually was seeing it there was a border over there and he saw me painting and he's like oh what's this what that and today he's going to come over to my 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 uh, i'm going to frame it and he just bought it um again let's have a look at, at this at this uh, plein air painting uh that is sarasota that is a boat kind of storage place and uh, I kind of was interested in this area. I don't know why. And so my highest contrast went into this area, basically this. You see how your eyes actually going right here immediately. There are some boats over there. There are some boats over there. And uh, somebody asked me a question here on, on uh, using an email. And they were asking me, let me clean it up before I sold it actually to, to the guy before I just frame it. And so Vlad, why is it your paintings have that kind of aura of air, like foggy sort of feel in it sometimes? And it's, I have to actually, I usually teach it on my workshop much more, um, how to say it, much more in depth. But, uh, but I have to tell you this, that um, everything I paint, I break into planes. And you can see that we have exactly three planes over there. I have a background over there, a mid ground over there, and a foreground over there. So basically before you, I start painting anything, I break it into the three, like, like sort of like a flat kind of cardboard cut planes. And it's enough for me to actually um, create creates three-dimensional sort of feel into that without resorting to too much detail. Make sense? So uh, as you can see, there are no bright colors anywhere here. It's just about nuances, nuances, nuances. But if I would choose to put a little bit of bright color over there, it would actually sing. I judge a lot of um, uh, uh, shows basically. And the question is, I'm, I'm desperately looking for my uh, brush and I don't see, oh, here it is, it's hiding here. I just want to clean it. And basically um, what I see sometimes, and it's actually getting my friends, I have to admit, worse and worse. Uh, the, your, your paintings sometimes, my, the student painting, beginner paintings becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. Of course, I applaud the, the, the manufacturers who can create such a bright colors for everybody. But at the same time, I'm kind of become worrying because uh, the depth, the, the, that inner kind of music in the painting uh, is disappearing. And uh, it is like a, sometimes becomes a competition who is brighter. But, but again, my friends, next year, manufacturers will come up with luminous colors, which are even lit at night. They can lit your room probably. And so what you're gonna do, you're gonna lose. I think that the, the, the paintings, the strengths of the paintings, not in a, that flashy look at me bright color thing. It's like an eye candy thing, but uh, I would actually usually look more closely and award the painters who are trying to uh, reveal the inner world. And basically uh, to tell you how to actually jump from this a type of bright paintings to the to the serious painting. I would say that in a professional painters, they don't really jump onto this wow factor um, sceneries. They uh, they are looking for the depths of it, and therefore uh, I noticed when I was teaching that there is something missing in the in the process of beginner or intermediate paint, painter. And when I start thinking about it, I realize that it's actually what's missing is their computer, their brain, their mind, so to speak. The beginner painter using their eyes as a tool, like lenses in the camera, and those lenses 
at the beginner painter, sending the, uh, the orders to the hand, basically. But in reality, the link is broken here because this lenses has to send information to your mind first, and then your mind sends the orders to the hand. It's hard to explain, and usually we're going through it when, I, when I'm doing workshops, but I just want to tell you that this just visual things is actually plays a very minor role in a serious painting, I think. It should play a minor role. Also, I would try to avoid, my friends, a subject matters such as fountains. Like I see some painters painting fountains, like a sculpture mountain. Let's think about it for a second. The fountain which has a sculpture is already a work of art of a sculptor. It's already reinterpreted reality, so to speak, if it's, of course, a good one. Why would you paint it? I mean, uh, maybe you paint the landscape or streetscape, which has a fountain in it. That's one thing. But when your focal point is the fountain, I think it's wrong. Such as like Eiffel Tower. Sometimes if you paint a Paris, which has a Eiffel Tower, in it, it's okay because it gives a flavor to the street or whatever. But when your subject matter is Eiffel Tower, that's kind of wrong. It's kind of a landmark that everybody already knows how it looks. And then when look at the painting at Eiffel Tower, I'm like, does it move me? Or is just a postcard sort of painting happen? And that is important to avoid. So basically, when I'm looking for subject matters in my paintings, I'm looking for something which is like a beauty, uncovered beauty. I'm kind of revealing for the people. Look there. Hey, stop for a second. Stop your run. Stop for a second. Look at it. Look how beautiful it is. And people are like, wow, why have I never noticed that? It's really nice. And you see what I mean? So basically, this is gives much more deeper impression on people, I think, than just sticking to this, like, you know, like a, like a cliche of things, all right? Next thing, my friends, it's like, um, let me remove this and this and that. And uh, some, uh, some artists I got questions about. Uh, I will answer your questions very soon. Uh, they answer, uh, they're asking questions about the, the technical aspects of paintings. And basically, basically, uh, let me just zoom out so you could see my palette too, okay? All right, so uh, basically I spray my, let me just spray them a little bit with water. So wakey, wakey, hey, wakey, 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 wakey. I need to refill it, I'm guilty here, but there's enough for me, I thought, to do demo for you something. My friend, these brushes I was talking about, I'm using the different types of washes. Uh, first of all, I prefer to mix on paper. That's one thing. And that is when it comes wet to wet technique or something. Let me just show you something. Like say my gold ochre right here. This is my yellow gold ochre, okay? And sometimes I prefer to mix not on my palette, but basically if I can, but I would prefer to mix right on paper. You see what I mean? So that creates an immediate, why did I arrive to that? First of all, when I was a kid, my, uh, my teacher told me that. He said, like, if you can mix on paper, hey. Uh, and really when I finish my painting, sometimes it's like gray and everything, but the palette looks great, amazing. The palette, and I'm like, what's going on? Why is it my palette looks better than my painting? And then I realized it has an immediacy of mixes right here and so I, I'm like oh okay I remember my my teacher told me to do that and so basically I do washes like let me remove this uh, uh, my uh, and I started doing this and and then I, 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 yeah right it's going like wonderful it's like immediacy of this brush strokes look at this I'm going from warm to cold over there is hard to uh, is hard to ignore. It's actually and look at this. If you leave it alone, it's still spreading around, kind of like a, this is. Now this is actually a very important. This is Kalinsky brush, and that's what I do large 
the mix is exactly like that. You see what I mean? Another type of uh, brush stroke, and, and basically one more time, you can, uh, while it's still wet, you can do uh, a different type of things like wet on wet uh, drops and everything. Uh, look at this. So basically if you need it a little bit like um, burnt sienish, a rust color, you can, you can just touch it then, leave it alone, uh, leave the angle. This is actually about 30 degree angle right now you're looking at, this is flat. Okay, so you always paint when it's inclined, by the way. And so, <clears throat> and so you see how they spread in itself and they're like, leave them alone, le let them just do their job, kind of like, a, and it's very, very washy, washy watercolor uh, look, a wonderful look over there. So it has, and that's one thing I would recommend you to do in terms of technique, if you can. And you can do it usually when you have to cover large areas. When it comes to, uh, coverage small areas of course I will mix on my palette right here so basically that's that's what it is uh, another thing is with these brushes rosemary brushes which we developed is that I'm using a lot of dry brush I don't really use dry brush I, I see recently some painters overusing it and they kind of like a look at me I am a dry brush and that I think it's a wrong attitude to the technique. You do, you're using the dry brush only when it's needed and you will have to use it really to make it successful only when it is necessary. But look what I do over here. This is synthetic fiber right here, very springy. By the way, if you buy your brush and you do this, it has to immediately spring back basically. Even a good natural fiber brush will do that. But basically what I do, I put it almost horizontal this is vertical. This is almost horizontal position to the paper. And look what I do. I do this dry brushing like this. You see what I mean? That's kind of sometimes, why to do that? Why would I do that, Vlad? Why do I need it to do that? My friends, basically the painting is very subtractive feel has to have. It's basically, I already told you, it's not about how much detail I have to show you, but it's about what kind of impression the painting has on you. And sometimes you just don't want to show all that detail. You want to give them impression of detail. And the dry brush will tell them a lot about texture of elements where you don't want to go detail. You don't have time to go detail or you, don't, you just feel there is going to be very destructive to the whole image detail like this. And so basically, basically dry brush like this would actually go a long way, look at this, to create that feeling of some kind of texturized surface in reality. In order for that to really be successful, you need to use rough paper. Okay, so um, this is 90 pound arches and I'm using arches mostly. And uh, uh, they have um, a weight of paper, like 90 pounds, 140 pounds. I don't know in grams exactly now what it is. And uh, 300 pounds and 300 rough surface paper is the roughest of them all. So basically uh, 140 would be somewhere in between. And that would be nice. Now, uh, uh, to, to show your uh, rough uh, uh, dry brush uh, that technique. Sometimes you can scratch it now. You see, there's about three, four, five minutes passed since I did this. And instead of using sometimes uh, your, mm, your um, gouache on top of that later, you can scratch it into a lot of white lines over there, which are actually stain white. You don't scratch it immediately. You need to wait three, four, five minutes. It depends on humidity, by the way, and then successfully use this method, okay? Uh, somebody asked me how, like say Vlad, for instance, you're going to paint some stones. I have like a shoreline, for instance, and a lot of stones over there. Let me just show you the big boulders. And, and they asked me like, what would you do to to paint them, how would you use your dry brush? You see what I mean? In order for them to, to, to do, let me just paint it for you. 
to make it successful. Uh, uh, first of all, we need to paint the water and I have, I'll just put it some abstract water right here, okay? And then I'm going to put abstract kind of sandy something. And I already will use hard, dry brush in this area, you see, kind of like I don't cover it all, so to speak, attitude, you see? And then we need to wait till it will dry. So basically everything is covered with water. I call it preliminary first wash, okay? Or first stage. And then we can continue about that. While it is drying, I can actually ask, uh, ask I'm sorry, to read your uh, questions right here. I can use a hair dryer, but we can use it for this. All right, so <clears throat> let's start with the first question. How long time are you painting each day, my friends? I was forcing myself to paint each day, but then I realized for me personally, it's detrimental now. So I take breaks. I always say that uh, you need to paint every day, not for me anymore. Why? Because actually I need to get rest. I need to re reset my brain. If I will be like a factory, like a Ford factory making cars, I would uh, probably, uh, sell, 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 sell every day, or learn, 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 which is good every day. Now I paint, I try to paint once in two, three days, basically. You see what I mean? So that's for me is important. Now, if you're learning something, you have to paint every day. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. So uh, if you, a student, trying to, uh, to, to, you know, to study certain aspects of painting, there is nothing wrong with that to paint every day, so that it would be fine. Good morning from Hawaii. Yes, good morning and welcome, welcome to this chat. Yes, I'm happy to have you there. Uh, another question, the light source so much sometimes, how can I choose the right light source? You, My friends, go outdoors. I mean, the light source outdoors is the strongest when we have a sun. In fact, it's very hard to work with colors in a studio because our best monitors are unable to compete with the natural range of light outdoors. The natural range of light outdoors, let's say, let's put it like in a, in a kind of proper, proper perspective, is if that would be like, say, five meters long, the natural light in your monitor would be five inches compared to that. So you're dealing only with light from light to dark with five inches length compared to this like dynamic range of light outdoors, which is like five, five uh, whatever I said, meters, I'm sorry, like, like say 100 feet, okay, versus five inches. That's a real difference. That's why when you work outdoors, plein air, uh, it's so much easier to mix colors. It's really, really uh, a, f a big, big actually a movement right now. Uh, go there and paint outdoors. It's much easier. Let me just make it clear myself. All right. Uh, how to deal with complicate background? Uh, is the simple better? How can I choose? and uh, delete some scenes by, uh, by what rule? Uh, yes, 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 good question. It's a good question. My friends, there are no rules. The rule is like this, my friends, look at this. I break my scenery into three distinctive planes. They are like cardboard flat planes. The background, the mid-ground, and the foreground. Okay, and I treat them differently. Usually my focal point is in the middle ground. And that's where my highest contrast is. Everything in the background, you have to, I call it fog it up, fog. You know what I mean? When you go outside and there is a fog, you can see far. You can see only just a few feet in front of you. Fog it up artificially, your background, to push it back. Now, and the foreground, my friends, the foreground is actually completely not fogged up, but and you can say that the highest contrast has to go there because it's closer to you. And I say, no, if it's your focal point is not on your foreground, it will be out of focus. Out of focus means you can have your contrast, but the edges 
needs to be dried brushed. They are not really well defined. And that's why we use the dry brush sometimes on the foreground. I use it a lot. And also, of course, I will remove the contrast. If you follow the camera in a good movie, you will see that the uh, cameraman knows the rules very well. And they manipulate their <clears throat> focus where they need it. Sometimes it's closer to you, sometimes it's further to you, but it's always not everywhere. <clears throat> I'm sorry, these cheap cameras, which we are buying, like a camcorders, they have such a small sensor. Everything on that sensor is in focus. And when you look at this uh, footage later, it's very boring compared to the professional cameras, which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they have lenses as such and a sensor that they can manipulate and put focus out of focus area very, very easy. And you should do the same. So that sketch, which I'm having here, and I'm going to show you, like for instance, this, that's what we did. I'm going to switch the cameras. And I'm going to zoom in for you. like this has some planes over there and you you can see that already on a stage of my sketch i divided it into three parts look at this background mid ground foreground very clear that's it that's all i'm dealing here that's why i like my sketches uh, to work with because it's so easy for me to paint this after I have done something which is actually compelling <clears throat> that I would, I would feel like kind of like I don't need even reality. I can paint the scenery just based on this. I refer to the photograph after I've done this just for color uh, references, but my values, my tonal values, it's all right here, broke into three parts. Make sense? So in fact, foreground was the tree also. So it's not only this, it's just foreground tree, which should be painted very rough. All right, next question is how to, <clears throat> okay, uh, what exactly moved you in this scene? Uh, which one, I mean, why was that element a focal point? Very curious. Yes, yes, that's a good question. What is it? What is it? Why this and not that? You will decide. Some people like this building, for instance. And some people will like this boat. And I tell you, it's up to you to choose your focal point. Just please don't choose it right here in the corner somewhere or here. Of course, naturally, it should tend to somewhere in the middle of your, of your, of your, uh, of your um, painting. Not middle, but one rule of thirds, etc. We don't have time to go into it. I repeat one more time. If you are a beginner, if you're curious about all of this, my DVD, which called, it's a last one, the latest one. It's just when I'm doing my um, workshops and I'm like, oh, it's watercolor workshop people, but I see you need it. And I tell them about this and how to draw cars and how to draw people and how to do composition and all three planes and all of that. And they're like, that's what I want. And I'm like, hey, but whenever I call, let's do next workshop about this. Nobody signs up. Everybody wants just to paint. But they got so excited about this drawing things that they said, look, that's a DVD we want. And so I just made it for them. And that DVD <clears throat> will discuss all of these issues over there. Now, another DVD I have, which is uh, the art of sketching, is concerned about the black and white representation of this, in fact. That's what I'm talking about, mostly planes, how dark, how light, what's your focal, how to pull it out and how to make it happen and how to paint based on that. If you can see with this sketch, I don't really need photograph anymore. It has that I, it has this like detractive sort of attitude already. The bare minimum of elements you put over there in your sketch, it's really, really guide you into your painting later on. And when I'm getting tired and all this detail in a real thing attacking me from right, left, and like, look at me, I'm beautiful. No, look at me, I'm more beautiful. Oh no, look at me, look what's going on there. It's so beautiful. And I'm like, I you wanna run away. You just put it aside and have a look at your sketch you have done. And it just tells you exactly amount of efforts you have to put into this part 
this part and this part, okay? Now, I will add detail usually at the end of the painting when all these ingredients, masses are put it, painted on my watercolor paper, I will just then will have a look. Oh, this boat has some kind of for the, for the, I, I forgot what it's called, or the, uh, for the like, uh, uh, Vyosla, whatever, uh, elements over there. This it has, it has a number over there, one, two, three, seven. Uh, you know, this has a tables over there. And I'll just selectively add just a few details, which I think would help the painting to have that kind of a little interest. The problem with beginner painters, they start with these elements because that's what jump in their eyes. The trained professional ignores that. They know they will add it at the end of the process. They will add it as a cherry on a cake. You see what I mean? But before you need to create the cake, the basis, they baked it and then they add these little things on top. Okay, I hope I'm clear about that. Uh, <clears throat> what is the incline of your table? It's about, my friends, 35, 30 degrees and that's enough. When I paint the sky, I just hold it like this horizontally. I know it's hard to see. Let me just maybe show you from the side. Maybe that would be, you see, this is like, this is horizontal and this is my inclination, okay? So basically when I paint the sky, I hold it until it dry like this. I don't want rainy skies because all these colors in the sky will just drip down and, and, uh, and that and that and that, all right? So next one. Is your painting surface at an angle, not flat? Yes, it's always, has to have an inclination. When you move in your watercolor, my friends, you're moving it from top to bottom and the gravity takes, let me zoom out a little bit, you don't see it, I know. And the gravity takes it down for you, you see? When I was in that architectural school, what we did for hours is did that bizarre painting with very transparent watercolor. And you see these beads, they appear right here. It's, you use these methods only when you cover in a very large surfaces like sky or ground. And so the next layer, you go into the bead and continue that in a zigzag sort of pattern, you see what I mean? And you see there is no beads appearing here. That means I'm making mistake. This is good, but this is, has no water. It's just too dry. It will dry on you in a matter of minutes, uh, seconds, if it's windy day or something. So you refill it and this. And then the next color, for instance, if I'm going cobalt blue here, I'm just loading it. You can go right here into the bead. And then you have a smooth transition from red to blue very naturally. You see what I mean? Look at this, into the bead, into the bead. And that is really important, that zigzag kind of technique. <clears throat> you don't use it in a small areas. It's just when you cover it. Oh, we just covered our stones here. I'm sorry. I have to start a new one, but well, anyway. We'll do it right here. So basically uh, that's what, what it is. And the uh, next question is, <clears throat> how do you incorporate your integrated shapes of value of light, mid-tones and darks into three planes? Um, how do you incorporate your integrated shapes of value of light, mid-tones and darks? My friends, again, uh, background, and look at the scratches, they become dark. So you basically don't go over them, it tells me. My friends, basically your highest contrast goes into your focal point. That's where your actually interest is. A human eye is designed that way that when you, when, when you look at the painting, it really jumps into that point or areas of high contrast. So if you don't want them to really concentrate on the background, you have to really smooth it out and so, basically make it flatter. You see what I mean? So uh, it's actually very plain. It's like flat almost like. 
and um, and a foreground uh, same thing usually your focal focal areas in the mid ground usually not necessarily so uh, how to incorporate it do not incorporate too much uh, the lit area uh, shades and cast shadows into your backgrounds especially it all has to concentrate into your focal areas and that's where you explore to its fullest again i saw some paintings not a bit painters mostly illustrators and they tend to uh, overplay uh, contrast in all three planes okay or mid ground and foreground and immediately it is very hard to look at this there is no really message in the painting it's like oh look at me and then another in the corner of the painting, oh look at me oh look at me as if it's like showcase of technique or something but remember again the fine art is not showcase of technique is that sometimes it's like how successfully you were able to convey the sense of the scenery it has nothing to do with you know, uh, this contrast and all that stuff everywhere it's and, and this and this and that so basically let me show you because I covered it, I'm going, you can, you, I might just like shut down the sound and dry it, okay? And I'm going to show you, let me just shut down the sound now. It's going to be very loud with this. And I think it's dry enough, okay? And so basically, basically, um, when it comes to darks, I'm wiping my palette. It's just too much water here in this washes, okay? We already passed the time, but it's okay, we'll stay. Uh, and I'll answer again your questions. So if you have questions, you can, you can ask me right now. And then basically what we're going to do is I mix something darker here, all right? Uh, <clears throat> that theory of color I usually give on my workshops because it's a little bit more complicated, takes a long time to, uh, to kind of comprehend. I need, some, I need to work with it and, uh, and uh, uh, like look at this. And then I have emergency dark, so to speak. Some people asking me, Vlad, what colors goes into your emergency dark? And look at this, it's like indigo I'm putting it. That's my good old indigo, which I'm mixing now because it's changed. And then I'm putting burnt sienna right here. Look at this, burnt sienna right into it. And, and then I'm going into um, the axis in violet into the mix. And so basically I have this kind of like a neutral tint which created uh, artificially by myself, so to speak, you see what I mean? So, um, and so when I, if I wanna paint a stone kind of like stones here around this, I ask myself a question, what they are, are they cool or warm or it depends on the time of the day sometimes, but you can mix uh, some kind of colors here. Let me show you uh, like, it's just like a regular gray or something. Let's do a grayish sort of thing. Okay. Like a grayish kind of stones, like nothing special. And so you have to decide where the light comes from here or from here. And, and uh, if the light comes from this side, uh, so the, everything on the right, look, is going to be sort of darkish in shade, you see? Like pa, 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 pa. Okay, the smaller one there over there, okay? You can even, uh, you can even, <clears throat> sometimes I'm using like, a, <clears throat> like this kind of like, like uh, like uh, like uh, dabbing, and then when uh, when it's still wet, I can attach my look at this cast shadows. Now to understand cast shadow relationship, like that's what you have to learn. By the way, is uh, understanding the relationship between your uh, uh, shades 
light areas and cast shadows is very important. That's what you, so you don't really paint mindlessly anything. You have to be in a, and I'm telling you the story, like, you see, this is stones. That's it. That's a stones on a, on a beach, uh, so to speak. Let me just lit it. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, that's enough. You can do water, like darker, whatever, because I, we covered it accidentally, you see? Oh, that's your water, so to speak, you see? Goes into this, huh? like, and, and that's about it. My friends, let me tell you the story about the practicing and painting a lot. Uh, when I moved to Florida, and you probably heard that story, because I, it's actually it just illustrates everything what I just told you. When I moved to Florida, I start playing tennis and I sign up for the club where, uh, uh, let me show you my face, uh, uh, where the uh, players were playing all the time. Okay, hold on. And um, here I am. And uh, basically, every time I was there, there are two guys playing every day. Why? I haven't been there every day. Sometimes I was playing on Tuesday. Sometimes I was playing Sunday. You know, it depends on my schedule. I was busy schedule working for architects too, painting for myself. But every time I was there, they were, I was sure that they're, they're playing. They, they were retirees, they have nothing to do. And then you would say that probably has to be, they become good. But no, three years passed and these guys not become any better they just were enjoying their game i don't blame them they probably no they actually were anxious because i played leagues with them they're very they want to win really believe me every day there every day playing no better and then there is one guy came in he was from belarus the secretary called me, oh, Vlad, they're looking for you. I said, who, Russians? And I'm like, I want to run. Uh, no, 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 they're like about uh, tennis, okay. A uh, 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 father and his young son, he, how young? 16, 17, maybe, thin as a matchstick. Like, like a young, thin, no muscle tone, no nothing guy. And he said that they are looking for, you know, where to go playing and everything. We have. We have tennis academy right next to me. And though, and so he beat everybody there, he said, but they could not accept them. I don't know, they were legally in country or illegally, and they were asking me advice. I said, I have no idea, guys. I just play tennis time to time. I have, can give you advice. And I said, and then I, after conversation, I realized they, they kind of need help financially, this, you know, they can find support and everything. I said, all I can tell you guys is probably your son can give me, it looks like he's a professional pain, a player. He was from academy, he graduated from a, a tennis academy in Belarus. I can just pay him uh, uh, if he will give me some lessons and we can do as many times as you want because I want to win too. And they said, agreed, my friends, I went on the court next day with that guy. He's sending the balls towards you. You don't want to hit by that ball. I tell you what, I never played with professional painter of this level, but you don't want to play against them if you have no training. The balls was hitting the ground and after that accelerating with such force that it was visibly faster than he was sending it. It's, you can't reach, I, could, I can't, could not return these balls. I cannot stand against him for three minutes. No, for one minute, you cannot stand a play against that guy. So what I'm telling you, this three, these two guys playing for three years in front of me every day, no progress. And that guy properly trained and you cannot play with him because he's that good. Technically, it tells me everything. It tells me that it's really when you work, you have to put your brain into that. You have to resolve your tasks. You have to be onto something, just picking a brush and just mindlessly applying it on the canvas or watercolor paper is not gonna make you a better painter whatsoever. You need to learn that craft and basically learn from the pros. I, that's what I would tell you. And so on this, let me read the questions, but we are done. I will answer all your questions right now. 
And then, oh, you know what he did? <laughs> he was teaching me how to serve. So he put four balls in the corner of the serving area and he breaks it every time he didn't miss. He just breaks the pyramid when he's serving. I, I mean, come on, I mean, come on. And he didn't break it like really just, just as. It was powerful serves. You can't return, really. I can't return, I'm sorry. Nadal can, uh, Federer can, no, not me. All right, let me look at your questions, guys. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, okay, your palette is horizontal. Yes, my palette is horizontal. Have a look at this. I just created this kind of uh, thing so that my palette would be staying horizontal right next to me. And uh, usually it's on the side. You see, I have a table which is horizontal on my right. And I would do this, but because I'm doing live alongs and I'm going to show you again, I want you to see them simultaneously. And I'm going to show you. It's very important for my students who paint alongs to see my palette. You see what I mean? So they see the palette and the painting. And that is actually, and that is actually very important because the most important thing happens here in the palette, not really even here. I spend much more time mixing sometimes what I want and putting these colors over there, mixing here, but putting it from this palette, okay? And so, <clears throat> how do you think abstract paintings is that high level requirement? What do you mean? I don't understand. How do you think abstract painting? How do I think abstract painting? Is that high level requirement? Yes, you have to think abstractly. It's like shapes, forms. I think in terms of three-dimensional thing, things like forms mostly, but abstract painting is, they're, they're very important for you to train you in terms of the really abstract thinking because painting is abstract representation of reality, you like it or not. And that's why I think that if you have that kind of abstract level of thinking, it's very important. That's why when I opened the school, I never worked in the drawing with uh, children which were younger than fifth grade because before that they don't have that um, developed abstract way of thinking in their brain it's just not developed enough and it's very hard to teach them how to draw correctly make sense all right how do you keep the paint from beating up on the palette uh, if you buy a new palette it will always beat up and then in time it will be just smooth as a butter like this so it's usually not a problem uh, so let me let me just um, I got I received some questions from on emails. Let me see. It's right here, and I just printed it. Um, um, how do you do bry, brush leaves uh, first slowly, then quickly? Brush leaves. I'm going probably to show you maybe right here. And do you stretch your paper before class? I never stretch it. I just tape it around with tape. And if the painting any good, I actually put it up upside down and uh, through the fabric iron it and then frame if I wanna sell it or it's I like it that much. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that you paint wet on dry, but keep your paint mixtures very wet, like the consistency of milk. So you can charge in various colors in different places. If you washes, is that what you actually do? Yeah, when initial washes, you do like basically 90% of water. Initial washes, you actually paint your light. And therefore you want that white paper to shine through this wash. So therefore there is basically very little pigment over there. And that's the only way to keep your painting luminous. So um, later on, when we, like I showed you how to paint the stones, uh, the shade side of it has to have 50-50, about take it or leave it, percent of water and pigment. And the cast shadows are basically sometimes just 90% of pigment. And that's it. And that's why it looks so dark. You don't let the chance of paper shine through this. And let me just show you this, basically the tree thing. Uh, as you can see, I mix my colors. I don't have even green. I mix my greens. I don't buy green colors. So basically, if this is my green, anything like uh, 
of any, any kind of like uh, any green I can mix actually for you from brightest to the, so basically the leaves, I don't pay attention to individual leaves. For instance, this is the tree right here with the trunk. I start somewhere here from the middle. Let me push it aside. And I just drag it, drag it, the dry brush, sort of speak, trying to create that kind of abstract shape somewhere, you know what I mean? Along the way, the tree of I like, you know? Look at this. That's kind of time things like this. Okay, then I'm going to my emergency dark sometimes and it helps me immediately go into darker parts of the tree like this, look. You can even like splatter it like I forgot that word. Okay, and then I sometimes I'm going to, uh, to that using my sword brush, look at this. I'm going to just paint on a fly the trunk, look at this the trunk, this is wider trunk, look at this. And then that brush let me just from wide go to very thin, like a hairline thin branching. Let me just remove this kind of paint from it. Do you see what I mean? The, it's incredible the way I discovered this kind of type of brushes not long time ago. And since then I could never go back to regular liners. That just because it's so much more Mm, you can do with it, you know what I mean? So, and that's kind of like things you, you can play. That, that brush can do like a hairline. Look at this hairline. I should actually zoom in if I can. I'm not sure I can do it for you. But from this to this, look at this. I'm going to, to zoom in with another camera. And uh, zoom in, look, because it can zoom in really. This is professional uh, camera. And I'm going to show it to you. Oh, like this, you see? That's how that brush can work. A hairline, a basically from this thick uh, uh, branching immediately into something like this or like this. It's incredible. It's, I really, really like it. Now, some, some of you has these brushes already, but in all my workshops, people uh, are asking me, you know, that uh, how to use it, I teach them. And then, then they come to me and they say, we cannot do anything with it. And then that's how you check your brush. You just spring it and it should come back into original shape immediately, basically. And the faster it goes to original shape, the more and more likely you will be able to, that's how I paint it, like I hold it by the, by the, uh, by the end. Let me show you. And it's basically, it's basically a vertical kind of affair. I, I just hover like a helicopter above it and I can do this Japanese calligraphy. Chinese color, no, I'm just kidding, I don't know this, but it's appearance of this. And where do you need it? You need this kind of lines when you do your handrails, uh, you know, iron work, lamps of any kind, uh, tree branches, it's a lot. I mean, I probably cannot, and you do it at the, I repeat at the end. That, my friends, I think our time is up and um, let me just show myself, show yourself a lot, yay. Uh, hold on. Try it. I'm really thankful for you to attend this and I hope you learned a lot, by the way. Uh, my, 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 I mean, if this is session, free session is so informative, can you imagine how my, uh, my classes are and my workshops are? Uh, so uh, you will learn really a lot. And that's what I think is important for me. Uh, if I take your money, I will give you something in return. And I probably will give you much more in return. I will give you, in fact, everything I can. Uh, sometimes it's just too much information. Somebody told me, Vlad, learning from you is like drinking from the fire hose. And uh, yeah, I agree. But learning is never easy. But I want you to be a great painter. Again, I hope you had a great time. I hope you stay in healthy. And I hope to see you in the future. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.